introduce today's speaker, let me remind you that after our lecture, the speaker has kindly offered to answer questions that you, the audience, will submit. And uh, this will be done by email to this address, physics at umich.edu. There will be streaming of that email address for questions during the lecture occasionally. So please uh, send us your questions, email us your questions. So welcome to our last, so the last of our four Saturday morning physics presentations for this semester. It's my great pleasure to introduce Alec Thomas, who is a professor <clears throat> of nuclear engineering and radiological sciences here at the University of Michigan, and also a faculty member in the Department of Physics. Alec, a fellow Brit and uh, esteemed collaborator, came to us at the University of Michigan from Imperial College in London where he earned both his undergraduate and doctorate degrees. Professor Thomas is currently associate director of an exciting new laser facility here at the University of Michigan, funded by the National Science Foundation, the Zetawatt equivalent ultra sh short pulse laser system or Zeus for short. And uh, with a name like that, it's expected to be the highest power laser in the nation, if not in the world, when it begins operations here at the University of Michigan in 2023. Dr. Thomas has received Young Investigator and Early Career Development Awards from the Air Force and from the National Science Foundation, as well as a Research Accelerator Award sponsored by the U of M College of Engineering. Our warmest welcome to Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much for the very nice uh, introduction. And uh, it's great to be here in front of such a uh, huge audience uh, for uh, for this talk uh, to talk about uh, fantastic uh, light. So uh, I'm going to talk about a particular kind of light. Um, that's uh, laser light. Uh, now, light from lasers actually is fundamentally the same as any other kind of light, the same as the light from these spotlights here. Um, but what is light? So light is made of uh, photons, which are individual uh, packets of energy, uh, but those uh, packets of energy behave, so they're, they're particles, but they behave uh, as if they're waves. Um, and uh, so a wave, it's like in the uh, drawing up on, on the right-hand side, is a sinusoidal-like uh, oscillation. Um, it has a, a set wavelength that describes the distance from peak to peak. And uh, the energy of this particle, the photon, is inversely proportional to its, uh, its wavelength. So if uh, we have blue light or red light, blue light is a shorter wavelength, so the photon of blue light is higher energy. Um, and that's true for spotlights, just as it is for my laser pointer here, um, which is green in this case. Um, the difference is that uh, just how these photons are arranged. So in uh, uh, ordinary light, the photons are sort of jumbling around randomly. Uh, so the peaks and troughs of the waves 
add up in a jumbly way, a bit like a choppy C, uh, and there's no uh, uh, structure. In uh, laser light, it is coherent, so the peaks and troughs tend to overlap, and that means that laser light has certain properties. It is brighter uh, uh, than ordinary light because the peaks and the troughs align and add up to uh, a brighter source. It can be focused to a tiny spot, so it, we can actually uh, focus the light, as we'll demonstrate later. And it can be uh, collimated in, in long beams. So you see this picture of a concert. You'll probably have seen this a uh, combination of laser lights and ordinary spotlights. You can see how the laser lights remain as pencil beams going across as long as the eye can see. Uh, the spotlights, you can see this sort of cone of divergence um, that they, they end up having. Oops, that was forwards. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with an extremely brief history of lasers. Uh, so in 1916, Einstein uh, proposes uh, stimulated emission as a, as a process. So if you have a matter, if you have some matter in an excited state, so it's uh, energized somehow, um, if one of these photons comes along, uh, it can stimulate another photon to be created from the matter. And those two photons then go on to produce four, four becomes uh, eight, uh, and so on. Uh, so we can get amplification of the original number of photons, so we can make the light brighter. Um, and also, because of the way these are created, all these uh, photons line up, so all their crests line up, and so we get coherent light, and that's why laser light is, uh, is coherent. So that was the proposal. In 1951, Charles Towns uh, conceives the microwave uh, uh, amplification method by stimulated emission. Um, and then in, the, in 1960, uh, Mayman demonstrates the first optical laser. It was a, a ruby laser. Um, and then uh, following that, in the 1960s, there was a huge explosion of exploring different materials uh, to make uh, laser light. So um, with respect to what I'm interested in, which is um, the uh, very intense light, um, I, I'm going to uh, use the following analogy, um, which I have to credit to uh, Donna Strickland, who we'll mention in, in a bit. Uh, so if I take a one watt uh, power laser, so this, this laser pointer here is uh, five milliwatts in, in power, but uh, you can buy from Amazon now for $100 dollars a, uh, a one watt laser pointer for whatever nefarious purpose you want it for. Uh, uh, and uh, if I shine a laser pointer even at one watt at any material, it doesn't really do anything. If I shine the laser pointer at the moon, it will pretty much stay collimated and hit the moon. It will travel uh, 380,000 kilometers um, and it will take roughly a second to get there. So in that second, at one watt, that's about a joule of energy. So uh, um, there's a joule of energy in that, that pulse. Uh, and so you can uh, sort of visualize this beam extending all the way to the moon. Now what's interesting is if we can take that pulse and then squish it down. So imagine that beam of light extending all the way to the moon, and we squash it down to a pancake of light um, and if we could squish it down to around uh, below the width of a pollen grain, so this is just a grain of pollen, which is 10 microns across, a fraction of a hair's breadth, uh, then we have uh, uh, increased the power because that one joule of energy is now released in a, a few femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And so that gives us a, a, a peak power, uh, energy divided by time of... Uh, approaching 10 to the 15 watts, which looks like a huge number. And just to uh, really emphasize how huge a number that is, the total electrical generating capacity of the entire world is only a few terawatts, or 10 to the 12 watts. So it's a 1,000 times more power than all of the power generated on Earth, uh, which sounds like it can't even be true, but of course that power is released for such a vanishingly small amount of time. Uh, we don't violate any energy conservation or anything like that. So, um, as you be aware, it really does matter how quickly you release energy. If you release energy in a very, very short period of time, uh, it can be quite destructive. 
Uh, so just to go through some of these time scales um, in, in nature, the shortest time scale um, measured is the decay of the tau lepton, uh, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Uh, the period that uh, the nucleus of an atom vibrates, everything is vibrating in nature, so these uh, nucleus vibrates in the time scale of 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Uh, the period uh, of an electron orbiting in a hydrogen atom is about 150 attoseconds. Uh, a single oscillation of this light, so um, uh, this, this wave, the, uh, uh, the period of the wave corresponds to uh, two femtoseconds. So our 25 second femtosecond duration pulse that we might be interested in um, is uh, just a few oscillations of light. That's the, what we're talking about if we can compress it. Um, the period of oscillation of atoms in a solid, if I uh, uh, perturb the, the solid and let the atoms jiggle about. It's on the time scale of picoseconds. Uh, the mean time between collisions of air molecules is a fraction of a nanosecond. And um, as I'm speaking to you, the period associated with the oscillations of the uh, air molecules due to the sound wave is, is, is a few milliseconds. So you can see this is an extremely brief um, period of time, if not, uh, if not the briefest. So now uh, I'm going to move on to uh, a history of extremely brief lasers, so uh, generating uh, these ultra-short pulses. So from the mid-1960s to the 1980s, there were various techniques to try and compress these, these short pulses. And I'm going to try and sort of illustrate how we make a short pulse using um, a demonstration with sound. So hopefully this is going to work. So I have a, um, a sound demonstration. So hopefully uh, this can be seen on the, on the camera. So I'm going to play a sound. OK, that sound um, is a very, very pure sound. It's almost just a single uh, note. Um, you can see I've uh, drawn what the wave corresponding to this note looks like at the top. If I zoom in, you can see that it's just a, a very pure sinusoidal note. Um, and at the bottom is a, is a spectrogram. It essentially shows the frequency content um, of the sound. And in this case, there is a single spike. Um, and uh, this note corresponds to about an E on a piano. Um, uh, so we have a single spike corresponding to that uh, single sound. Now, there's a phenomenon well known to um, musicians, which is if I have two sounds, so if I, if I just pick a different sound, here it's slightly higher, higher. the uh, wave uh, form at the top is quite difficult to see that it's any different, except for I've colored it green instead of red, but in terms of the, the period. But you can see that when I change the sound, the um, spike moved to the right, so uh, the frequency of that sound is slightly higher, and I can go higher still. So what if I mix these notes together? Um, so it's a well-known phenomenon to musicians. If I mix two notes together, I get a, a beating sound. And this is because uh, the, way, the wavelengths of these two sounds are very slightly, one's very slightly longer than the other. That means initially, if they are in phase with the peaks aligning, um, we get a, a loud sound. But then as we go forward in time, the, uh, uh, since one has a longer period than the other, eventually we get to the point where the trough cancels with the peak of the wave and it, it cancels out the sound. And so we get this characteristic uh, beating sound. And as we get closer together, there's two frequencies that are very close together. And you can hear this uh, very slow, uh, beating, and that is um, uh, uh, used if you're tuning a good guitar to get the, uh, the tuning right. Well, what if we add uh, lots of frequencies together? So if I add three together, okay, now you start to see that I get cancellation 
um, over a broader range, and, and there's one small region in time where um, I'm getting adding together of the frequencies and I'm creating um, uh, a large amplitude. And now if I add, so I'm just going to add 11 frequencies together. So all of those frequencies are beating together, and only at one particular uh, uh, point in time, which is repeating, um, do all of the uh, crests add up and the troughs add up and I get um, uh, a high amplitude and then they gradually all cancel out. And so I get um, a pulse and so you heard that sound, it sounded like a, a beating sound. Um, and so uh, we can do the same with light. Uh, so if we can uh, get lots of different frequencies, um, so if we can amplify uh, lots of different colors in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in light, and add them together in a certain way, um, then they can add up to form uh, pulses, and then we have a very, very brief uh, burst of uh, light. Um, so uh, I'm not going to explain. In fact, other Saturday morning physics lectures have explained how these uh, mode locking techniques work to, to add these up to, to make sure that they all remain in phase. Um, but these were. Uh, uh, invented in the uh, 60s to 80s, and then 82, uh, Peter Morton invented a tie sapphire, which is a very important material for amplifying. So it's basically a big crystal of sapphire, gemstone, um, and uh, it has this, a special property of being able to amplify uh, lots of different colors. So it's exactly what you want for uh, making sh ultra short pulses. The problem with ultra short pulses is uh, they're ultra short. So it means there's a lot of energy packed into a very, very short period of time, as we've demonstrated. And the problem is that if you then start trying to make, put more and more energy into these pulses, um, they eventually become so powerful that they destroy whatever medium you're trying to amplify them in. And so this was a, a, an issue um, that was resolved in uh, 1985 in, in a, a seminal paper by Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru, um, who invented a, a technique called chirp amplifier pulse amplification, which I'm going to explain in a, in a second. Um, and that allowed us to amplify pulses to very, very, very high powers indeed. Um, in uh, 1990, after Girard had moved to the University of Michigan, he uh, set up the Center for Ultrafast Optical Science, which is now named the Girard Maru Center for Ultrafast Optical Science, which I'm a part of. And in 1996, the powers had got so high that we had the world's first petawatt laser. So uh, uh, this very, very powerful laser, we'll see what that does in a bit. In 2018, uh, uh, Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru were uh, honored with the no Physics Nobel Prize for this invention, along with Arthur, Arthur Ashkin. So what is a chirp pulse amplification? Well, the, the idea is that we want to um, uh, somehow stretch the pulse in time, um, so we make it longer, and then the power level drops, and then we can pass it through amplifiers, and uh, it won't damage the crystals. But then we need a way of recompressing it to, to reconstruct our shorter pulse. So we need to somehow encode some information uh, into the pulse so that we can reconstruct it. And uh, the method that's, uh, that uh, Strickland and Marie came up with was uh, to use uh, a chirp. So a chirp, um, is where you actually separate all, all of those frequencies and delay them in time so that they're arriving at uh, uh, different times. Um, so first, I'm just going to move to um, how this is achieved using this uh, diffraction demo. Okay, so if we look at the, uh, the wall, we have uh, two laser spots, one green and one uh, red. And um, so this is just coming straight from the laser and reflecting off a, a mirror and going onto the wall. So I'm going to put in into the beams uh, a diffraction grating. So diffraction grating um, uh, acts a bit like a prism. It basically, um, uh, because of the wave-like nature of light, uh, it uh, diffracts in the uh, grating and the different uh, wavelengths will travel in different directions because of the way the waves add up. 
And so you can see that um, in the center here, the green and the red remain the same because these are the ones that have gone uh, straight through. But we also get these diffraction orders. Um, so light is diffracted in a, in a series of orders uh, in, a, in a pattern, in a diffraction pattern. And you can see that the uh, red is bent uh, by more than the, the green. Uh, so we can make use of this phenomenon. Um, so if we separate out, as you can see in the uh, picture here, um, separate out these colors um, with the red parts of this short pulse of light going one way, the blue going another, then the blue can, will travel a longer distance than the red, and so it'll, they'll be delayed. And I'm gonna just to illustrate this with another sound example. So I've recorded um, a clap sound. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just me clapping. Um, so that's uh, that clap. Again, we can look at the trace in time and it's this very short burst of, 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 of sound. Um, and uh, if we look at the spectrum, the sound, so it's similar to when I was looking at these discrete uh, peaks corresponding to these uh, uh, very pure sounds. But now we've got loads and loads of peaks because there's a huge range of different frequency vibrations that have to, uh, uh, that compose this, this short burst of uh, sound in this case. So what I can do is um, algorithmically delay some of the sound components uh, compared to others. Um, so I've, I've done that. So I've just made it so that um, rather than arriving at the times they do to make the clap, I've made the, um, the low frequencies arrive faster and the uh, higher frequencies take some time to arrive, as, which is sort of similar as if I made the sound uh, the low frequencies travel on a, a longer path than the, the high frequencies. And I get the sound. Hear that? Uh, that, that sound. Uh, so the, it starts because the, the low frequency sounds arrive first. And then it sounds like I've computer generated this, but it is exactly the same frequency com content as that, as that clap sound. And you see the effect is that it's stretched out so that the power, you can see that the power in the pulse, the amplitude, is much lower because all that energy is stretched out over a longer period of time. So now I could amplify this, but because of this uh, encoding of uh, time and frequency, I can do the same trick backwards using a different arrangement of um, with light gratings uh, to compress all those colors back together in time and reconstruct my shorter pulse. But now it is at very, very, high powers. And so this has already had uh, quite an impact on um, society. Uh, so um, the thing about uh, these ultra short pulses is that uh, they deliver a lot of power, but without a lot of energy, which means that if you hit material, um, if I hit it with a laser pointer, nothing happens. But if I hit it with an ultra short pulse, it uh, uh, ablates material, burns off uh, material but it doesn't deliver a lot of energy, which means it doesn't heat the material, which would cause damage over a wide area. So you can get incredibly precise machining of materials and uh, laser machining of eyes, laser eye surgery, um, is, is already a many, many billion dollar business. Um, many operations to correct people's eyesight using uh, femtosecond lasers. And uh, they can also be used for laser micromachining for very precise, essentially using it as a a laser um, drill. But uh, we are interested in the, the highest field strengths possible. And um, uh, one way that's achieved is uh, through focusing the light in a way, not just in time, in a way making these short pulses is kind of uh, focusing the light in time, compressing it in time to deliver it in the shortest uh, uh, period uh, possible. And we can also focus it uh, in space and try and focus down to the, the tightest 
uh, spot. So I'm just going to switch to um, another demo. Oh, that's really beautiful, isn't it? Um, really, this is a completely unnecessary demonstration, but when I saw the list of demonstrations, I just uh, I thought this was very uh, beautiful. So. Uh, so here we have uh, three um, uh, laser beams. These, these are just uh, laser beams. So you could imagine um, uh, a big, large beam of light being composed of many, 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 many little laser beams. This, so this is for illustrative purposes, just picking out three uh, uh, beams of light. And uh, these uh, are traveling pretty much in a straight line. You can see they're just collimated uh, laser beams. And if I insert uh, a lens, so the lens has, uh, as, you, as you hopefully can see, uh, has a curved uh, surface, so there's different thicknesses of, of light. So as the light passes uh, through the different thicknesses, it refracts, and the particular shape of the lens means that all the light rays converge, if I get this right, there we go, uh, to a point. So if we have a, a, a large beam of light, we can make all the light rays that compose that light converge and form a very small spot of light as is illustrated at the end here. If we have very, very tight focusing, by, so by having a, a, a very thick lens um, with a lot of refraction, hopefully I can get this to work. Oh, I have to go further than I thought. So, so that you can see that the light's uh, bending more rapidly and converging to a focus more rapidly. And what that does is it it uh, brings in the all the photons uh, uh, closer together and makes a, a tiny, a, a, an even smaller spot. And so, by focusing as hard as we can, we can uh, intensify all those photons so that they're not just uh, delivered in a uh, short period of time, but also uh, a small region of space. Uh, and we've lost the presentation temporarily. What have I done? Oh, we're back. Okay. So what that corresponds to uh, is uh, a very, very strong electric field. So as we intensify it, so you can imagine that we take our pancake of light that I, that I was talking about, so where we've squished that uh, few joules of energy reaching to the moon into a pancake of a fraction of a hair's breadth in thickness. And now if we further focus, um, we could focus incredibly tightly, um, which would intensify the light. So intensity is the uh, amount of, uh, power per uh, uh, unit area. Um, and what it translates to is uh, it's related to the electric field of the laser. So as we intensify the photons and they all add up, uh, they're little, each one of them is an is a electromagnetic wave. So they all add up to an incredibly uh, uh, strong electric field. And so if you sort of uh, uh, unwrap all this equation, you get an electric field in volts per meter, um, which goes as 10 to the 14 times the square root of the power of the laser in petawatts, divided by whatever spot size you can achieve in microns. And um, typically, that's one thing with lasers, is, is if we focus really tight, we can get down to even um, uh, 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 wavelength scale light. So, uh, 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 for optical wavelengths, that's about of order one, one micron. So um, uh, if you want to sort of have a mental picture of what this looks like, uh, just for argument's sake, let's say we focused down to a 10 micron spot. So it's 10 microns in width. You have this light compressed, all, all of that energy compressed into something that is basically the size of a pollen uh, grain. So it's a sphere of light uh, in, with 10, 10 microns in, in diameter. Okay, so what can you do with very, very strong electric fields? Well, um, one 
uh, way that uh, scientists use strong electric fields is to accelerate particles. So particle accelerators um, are used uh, for high energy physics research. So they're at the forefront of fundamental physics discovery. Um, more recently, they, are, uh, they generate very high energy electrons which are converted to uh, X-rays with coherent properties which are fantastic for imaging. So these can be used uh, in biology and materials science and condensed matter physics research. Um, so if you want to look at the structure of materials using X-ray diffraction, um, or as a particularly topical uh, subject, uh, you might want to look at virus structure. Uh, uh, so that's one application of uh, particle accelerators. And uh, they're also used widely in, in uh, medicine for, uh, 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 for, for cancer treatments and in industry for cargo scanning, for example. Um, so especially for the, for the high energy machines, like those used for high energy physics and even for uh, making x-rays for um, these uh, scientific applications, the machines can be rather big, um, mile scale machines, or even in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, um, uh, what's well, 27 kilometers uh, long. Uh, the thing that limits them is uh, that the electric field strength is limited to about 10 to the seven volts per meter, because if it gets higher than that, then the material that composes the accelerating structure breaks down and destroys the machine. Uh, since energy is force times distance, if you can't increase the force, which is the electric field strength times the charge, then you have to increase the distance, and so the machines get bigger and bigger and bigger. You can, to a certain extent, um, get around that by making them circular, so you accelerate particles round and around in a circle over and over again, but eventually you reach the limit where they emit radiation, and that slows them down. Um, and so there is a push for advanced accelerator concepts which have stronger field strengths. And how, how do you do that? Uh, if you have stronger field strengths, then that means you can miniaturize the machine. So instead of a, uh, a mile scale accelerator costing billions of dollars or, or more to uh, evacuate tunnels under uh, great uh, big mountains, uh, you, you have a lab sized um, accelerator with the same capabilities. Um, so I thought it would be a good point to just sort of uh, uh, give a heuristic picture of um, what these, uh, what an electric field strength corresponds to in terms of accelerating particles. So what does a field strength uh, one volt per meter represent? So if we consider the acceleration of an electron between um, oops, a pair of uh, plates, so this is just basically a capacitor, uh, we charge up the capacitor to some voltage, so there's a constant electric field between the plates. An electron uh, starting at one end will be accelerated by the electric field, um, and the energy gain is force times distance, so the electron charge times the electric field times the length, uh, which corresponds to uh, uh, the electron charge times whatever the, the voltage is. So if we have 100 volts across here, uh, you can gain an energy of the electron charge times volts. Since the electron charge is a very small number, it's often convenient to express this in terms of electron volts, uh, this energy. So just as to get a scale of this, um, uh, a milli electron volt corresponds to the energy of uh, an air molecule buffeting us all at the moment at room temperature. Uh, an electron volt is the energy of a photon of green light, like my laser pointer here. Uh, a killer electron volt is the energy of a dental x-ray. So if you get x-ray, the, the photons that uh, can pass through your bone have killer volt energies. Uh, a mega electron volt, so um, as we'll see later, uh, e equals mc squared means that uh, energy and mass have some equivalence. So the um, mass of an electron can be converted into an energy, and that energy corresponds to about half uh, a mega electron volt, so a million half a million volts. A giga electron volt is the typical energies of these large synchrotron machines which are producing x-rays for uh, biological materials and condensed matter physics type applications. Whereas at the tera electron volt level, that's 
the sort of high energy physics machines, the Large Hadron Collider has a center of mass energy of 13 GeV. And then if we get up to a petroelectron volt, again, that pet are coming in, that's a very large number, so that's uh, cosmic rays that might hit you once, once per year. Um, and there are many lasers now around the world that can achieve uh, 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 petawatt level powers. Um, so this, this map here every, shows uh, lines with every line indicating a facility with um, uh, multi uh, terawatt laser facilities. Um, and there are lots of uh, lasers that are getting to the petawatt level um, uh, in the US, in, in Europe, and in Asia, and in uh, Michigan, we have our Hercules laser, which is uh, half a petawatt. Um, and so that looks really good. The electric field um, in, in the, the, of the laser, if we take a, a petawatt laser focused to a micron, it's 10 to the 14 volts per meter. So that's many, 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 many orders of magnitude higher than um, uh, these conventional accelerators. So that's great. Let's use a, a laser to accelerate particles. We should be able to miniaturize it and put it on a microchip or something. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so what, does, uh, what do these electric field strengths uh, correspond to in nature? Um, so as you're thinking about what I'm saying now, little electric impulses are going on in your brain. They correspond to about one volt per meter. Um, lightning, when that strikes, that's about uh, 100,000 volts per meter, as is a Van de Graaff generator, which you've probably seen pictures of. If you touch it, all your hair stands on end because of the static electricity. Uh, the uh, electric field corresponding to the ground state of hydrogen is about 10 to the 9 volts per meter. Uh, if we get to 10 to the 12 volts per meter, then an electron can be accelerated to its, its rest mass energy, so speed of light, essentially, that means, uh, close to the speed of light, uh, uh, in only a one micron gap. And the significance of that is that our laser wavelength is a micron, so that means it should be uh, in a, in a, in a in a, within a wavelength, uh, accelerated to uh, very high energies. And at 10 to the 15, uh, protons should be accelerated to the rest mass energy within the laser uh, uh, cycle. And if we got to extraordinarily high intensities at 10 to the 18 uh, volts per meter, we would limit, reach a limit where the vacuum itself would uh, break down, uh, which I will talk about uh, later. There is a big, big problem with a laser field though, and that is that it's pointing in the wrong direction. So a laser field uh, oops, is, uh, consists of uh, a transverse electric and magnetic fields, which are orthogonal to each other, uh, and it, but it propagates uh, in the direction that's perpendicular to both the electric field and magnetic field. So that means that uh, if you think about accelerating a particle, um, as the laser passes through it, it's going to be accelerated one way, then the other, and so the net result is that uh, you don't get any acceleration. So that's not going to work. We can't, uh, we can't uh, use a, a laser to sustain, to do sustained acceleration. Um, but uh, what we need is uh, some way of coupling um, uh, the laser to a, a longitudinal field, a field that goes in the direction of the laser. So, um, so one way we can do that is using um, plasma. So this, uh, oh, I'm going to be standing in front of the camera here. This globe here uh, is filled with, with gas and a, a, a large voltage is applied, uh, which ionizes the gas, strips the electrons off and creates a plasma, which as the electrons recombine with the, the ions, uh, produces the brightly colored glows that you can see. Um, and plasma has the properties of being um, uh, strongly affected by electric and magnetic fields. Um, when we focus a laser, an intense laser on any matter, the strong electric field is going to rip the electrons off and uh, uh, ionize it such that we have this soup of electrons and ions uh, that uh, consist of positive and negative charges. Um, one of the, the main things with plasma is if we then try and pull these uh, 
particles apart, so if we pull the electrons from the ions, the electric field that's set up by that charge separation is going to pull them back and set up all kinds of oscillation modes. And uh, one sort of oscillation mode that's important for this is we can get uh, compressional oscillations, uh, analogous to sound waves. So I'm just going to illustrate the difference between these oscillations using this uh, slinky here. So um, uh, if I uh, wiggle my arm uh, at some speed, left and right, you can see these transverse oscillations um, of the slinky propagating down. And if I wiggle my arm faster, you can see that the oscillations travel faster. And not only that, but their wavelength gets shorter. Uh, this is exactly the effect I was describing at the very beginning with the, with the light waves. You can see that the, the transverse, the oscillation in this case is transverse. And so this is like a light wave os oscillation. In plasma, it can support some transverse waves, but it can also support uh, a wave mode like this, which is analogous to a sound wave. So you can see um, as I wiggle the slinky, it compress, it ultimately compresses and stretches uh, because of the tension in the, in the spring, um, uh, giving a restoring force. Um, in the case of plasma, it's uh, if I displace the electrons away from the ions, there is a positive charge left over, which pulls the electrons back and initiates an oscillation. And the thing about the oscillation is that the field associated with this oscillation is propagating in the direction, is going down the direction of propagation. OK, um, so one thing we can do with this is uh, an accelerating technique called uh, laser wakefield acceleration. So in laser wakefield acceleration, we take our sphere of light. I re remember that pollen grain sized uh, sphere of light that I described earlier. And uh, that is propagating um, forwards. And, and the light is so intense because we've intensified it. It's pushing the electrons out pushing the electrons from the ions um, and creating this charge separation, which uh, pulls them back towards the ions and sets up this oscillation, but a longitudinal oscillation with an electric field that can be used for accelerating particles. So if I uh, put a, a, a beam of electrons in the right part of the electric field, uh, the laser and the electrons can move forward together and uh, the electrons can gain lots of energy from the, from the, from the electric field. Um, so a sort of uh, uh, one analogy of this is uh, the sport of wake surfing. So here we have uh, some people having great fun on a lake somewhere. Uh, so we have a speedboat, which is uh, being revved at very high uh, speed through the water. As it pushes through the water, it pushes the water out of its way. That water then uh, responds by um, oscillating backwards and forming a wave in its wake. And you can see this person here um, is actually surfing on the wave. You'll see there's no rope attaching him to the boat. This isn't like uh, him being pulled by the boat. Uh, he, is, he is using uh, the wave to, to push him along. So if you replace the boat by the laser pulse, the water by a plasma, and the uh, surfer by an electron beam, you've got a, a, a reasonable analogy of what uh, laser weight field acceleration is doing. Um, in practice, what this means is taking the laser pulse and focusing it into just a box of gas. So this is uh, from our uh, research group. It's just literally a 3D printed box, which we puff gas into. And then the laser does the rest. It comes in, it ionizes the plasma, generates this plasma wave accelerating structure and accelerates particles to high energy. Um, so just to refer back to this example of the electron being accelerated across a gap, uh, as we saw before, the maximum energy that this electron can gain is, is determined entirely by the voltage across this gap. And I can't increase the voltage arbitrarily high, um, but if I 
uh, make the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, accelerating structure be pulled along uh, somehow, so it's traveling at uh, some speed, then uh, that changes the maximum energy that I can get because um, let's take the pathological example where this accelerating structure, the electric field, is pulled along somehow at the same speed as the electron, then the electron never leaves the electric field, so it's just gaining energy, more and more and more energy. Um, so we can greatly increase the amount of energy uh, using this moving uh, structure. In fact, this is the same, exactly the same principle as accelerating structures in conventional accelerators. The only thing is, instead of uh, centimeter-sized accelerating structures, or 10 centimeter size accelerating structures, they're reduced to 10 micron sized uh, structures. Okay, so here's uh, just to give an illustration of what this wake uh, might look like. This is from a, a three dimensional uh, simulation um, performed on the Oak Ridge uh, su uh, supercomputer, the fastest supercomputer in the world. Um, so this is uh, using a simulation technique which solves all of Maxwell's equations and tracks all the particles uh, to try and uh, do one-to-one -one simulation of, of this laser weight field acceleration. So you can see this red blob at the front is the laser, and it, these white tracks are showing individual electrons being pushed out and then coming, coming together, uh, oscillating, and the uh, blue and yellow regions are showing the alternating electric field that's set up, and this is about a, a 10 micron uh, scale. It looks very much like the uh, structure in an accelerator. So uh, the latest in uh, Wakefield acceleration, uh, we can use optical diagnostics to actually uh, look at the accelerating structure. Um, and so this is now experimental data um, using um, optical probes to try and see what the accelerating structure looks like. And it looks very much like the simulations. Um, uh, the latest uh, results include uh, high energies. Um, the, the record for Wakefield acceleration is eight GV in a uh, 10 centimeter long accelerator. It would be something of order a mile to do this with a conventional technology. So that's, that's uh, good. Um, uh, very, very short uh, bunches of electrons. Uh, so another advantage is that the electron bunches that are produced are the same ultra short bunches that are produced that, uh, of the drive laser. Um, they can be very low energy spread. And uh, this is very recent result, 24-hour um, stable operation of these uh, accelerators. So this is really getting to the point where um, this is a, a useful tool for, for science. Um, and so there are many applications of these ultra-fast uh, lasers in, in, for particle acceleration. So I've mentioned one, which is accelerating of uh, electrons and possibly uh, positrons. Um, you can use them to accelerate ions as well. And there is some interest in uh, ion acceleration for, for cancer therapies. Um, you could also produce uh, sources of other, oops, I've gone to my cliche too early, uh, other particles, uh, muons, pions, etc., for various applications. One thing that seems um, very useful from uh, these particles is actually the x-rays that can be produced from them, uh, because uh, these x-rays uh, um, come from such a small source, everything with the laser is miniaturized, so it comes from a very so small source, so it has very high resolution for imaging, and that has been used in uh, biological imaging, imaging of material samples with high resolution, and even capturing hydrodynamic uh, phenomena in, in action using these x-rays. So uh, I want to just quickly go through uh, my last uh, uh, topic. Um, I think that putting a picture of Einstein with his tongue sticking out with e equals mc squared next to it has to be the greatest cliche in physics. Uh, so I thought I would just join in uh, with that. Uh, but one of the most important things uh, that we can extract from this equation is that um, uh, we, can, we should be able to turn light into matter. And um, this this E equals mc squared is uh, most nicely demonstrated by what is now a very useful uh, technique of positron emission tomography. So if we have an electron and a positron, 
Um, so an electron uh, is the normal electron we have in, in atomic matter, and positron is its antimatter counterpart. If they uh, collide, then they uh, annihilate, and their, their mass is turned into energy in the form of uh, two gamma rays, which uh, shoot out in opposite directions. And this is actually uh, the basis of a, um, a, a very useful technique for uh, cancer diagnostic uh, diagnosis called positron emission tomography. We can also do the process in reverse. So um, uh, it's a prediction of quantum electrodynamics, which is the theory that describes uh, light and relativistic uh, ordinary matter. Um, uh, S -s -s charged matter. So um, if we have two photons of light collide, as long as they've got high enough energy to create the, to create the mass, then they can create an electron-positron uh, pair. So from light, uh, matter can spring out. And this has been already demonstrated. So um, famously, back in the late 90s, uh, there was a, an experiment on the SLAC uh, 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 linear accelerator where they uh, collided an electron beam, converted into photons, which then interacted with a laser uh, to uh, do photon-photon creation of, of, of pairs. Um, it is also recently in a, a headline from um, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, spotting uh, the production of uh, W bosons um, by a similar process. So, uh, we, can, we know that we can create matter from light. Um, one particularly extreme version of this um, is called the uh, Schwinger, Schwinger Salter effect, um, is if you have a very, very, very strong field indeed, um, vacuum itself, which is, uh, is not an empty void, but it consists of many, many electron uh, uh, positron pairs, as well as lots of other particles, uh, uh, virtual particles springing in and out of existence. Uh, if a field is strong enough, it can actually pull these virtual particles apart and make and turn them into real particles. The net effect of this is that uh, um, you, from an electric field in vacuum, you suddenly start uh, having matter just spraying out from, from nothing, which would be uh, extraordinary. How strong does that field have to be? Uh, well, uh, 10 to the 18 volts per meter. So unfortunately, we are, uh, even with, if we could build 100 petal lasers, which are on the horizon, we, we are three orders of magnitude uh, below that threshold in terms of uh, electric field strength. Uh, but um, electric field uh, is not a, uh, the important quantity. Um, it turns out that the electric field, as measured in the particle uh, rest frame, is the important uh, quantity for determining whether some of these processes occur. Um, so uh, you, you may be aware of uh, 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 Einstein's relativity, um, that uh, uh, things that occur in different frames of reference when uh, uh, things are considered in a, in a frame of reference that's moving close to the speed of light compared uh, relative to another frame, then time and space get all mixed up. So uh, events that are simultaneous are no longer simultaneous. Uh, uh, things shrink, time dilates, all of these sort of weird effects. Well, um, electric fields uh, and magnetic fields also don't look the same in different reference frames. And so even though it seems like a trick, we can actually exploit this. Um, uh, if we have very, very high energy particles, then to them, a field can be uh, boosted to, to seem very, very high field strength. And in fact, by using a combination of very uh, high energy particles and uh, strong fields, we can see uh, these QED effects, including uh, the photon production and also um, pair production. Uh, so there was a recent experiment uh, uh, which um, was a first sort of exploring this area of strong, strong fields. Um, so a laser uh, was focused into a gas jet pr to produce a very high energy beam by laser wake field acceleration, the process I talked about. And then this was collided with a, uh, 
a laser, um, which is focused to as high intensity as possible. And so this sort of combines the two things I've talked about. So the light is intensified to as high intensity as we can, but it's still very small compared to this uh, Schwinger limit. But then by accelerating these particles to GeV energies, um, we boost the fields. And uh, in this case, it was um, getting to the point where uh, the photon emission was um, uh, highly stochastic, um, highly random, and uh, you could uh, see quantum effects in the slowdown of the electron beams. The next uh, step uh, would be something more dramatic, which is um, uh, to produce cascades of antimatter electrons and positrons um, from a near vacuum. So I've got one, one more demonstration for this. Uh, so one of the most uh, dramatic uh, predictions of strong field QED is the development of pair cascades. So if we have a single seed particle, and it can be a photon or an uh, electron, it doesn't matter, um, the, uh, uh, that particle um, in the strong fields will radiate, and then the photon will decay into an electron-positron pair, um, and, uh, but then those, the electron and positron can then radiate more, and produce more and more pairs which radiate and, and, and so we get an exponential multiplication and so from a single seed particle we can amplify to uh, a huge number of uh, particles. So in many ways this is um, analogous to either a cosmic ray shower, when a cosmic ray enters the atmosphere it can uh, produce many secondary particles, or in some detectors, so I'm gonna, this demonstration is of a, of a photomultiplier tube. It's a way of amplifying a single uh, electron. So um, an electron is accelerated in a, in a photomultiplier um, into uh, some material where it excites secondary electrons. Those secondary electrons plus the original electron go on to be accelerated into another uh, piece of material and excite even more electrons and so on until um, until we've amplified the number of electrons uh, dramatically. So let's just uh, show this. In, in this example, we have uh, a load of ball bearings representing particles in uh, various, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, anode, in the cathodes and in the anodes. And then uh, um, uh, gravity, in this case, is accelerating the particles down. So you'll see when I start with a single uh, ball bearing, Hopefully, at the end, we'll have many ball bearings coming out if this works. That worked extremely well. Okay, so, um, thank you. Uh, so we can, we can do this, but, um, uh, uh, the thing that's uh, uh, really interesting is that this is happening in a uh, hair's breadth of light. You would not think that you could um, uh, do this in a, in a tiny thickness of, of light. Um, uh, so this is a, a, um, one particular goal, and this is some relevance to um, uh, uh, physics that goes on in, in extreme events in... in, in um, in the cosmos, so uh, some neutron stars called magnetars have extremely strong magnetic fields, um, as well as in uh, gamma ray bursts and uh, the central engines of supernovae. Uh, so these strong magnetic fields, um, they may be magnetic fields, but when we have relativistic particles, very energetic particles interacting with them, um, again, it's the same effect that the uh, magnetic field now looks like a very strong electric and magnetic field to that particle. Um, and uh, so the analogous uh, photon emission and pair production uh, processes uh, occur, um, which causes cascades, which produces huge amounts of electron positron uh, plasma streaming out in jets out of the poles of these stars. So if we can reproduce these effects in the lab, uh, that could be uh, very exciting. And so, um, uh, that um, uh, brings me to uh, ending on Zeus. So Zeus is the uh, facility that Roy mentioned at the very beginning of the lecture. It's a very exciting 
um, prospect for University of Michigan. So uh, this is a new facility um, funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's uh, the project to construct it started last year and it's due to finish in uh, 2023. And the project is to build a new three petal laser um, here at the University of uh, Michigan, which will be the most powerful laser in the United States. But you'll see from the acronym that uh, ZEUS stands for the Zetawatt equivalent of short pulse laser system. So how can we claim a Zetawatt um, when it's a petawatt? Uh, well, the important word is equivalent. And the reason is that the laser is set up specifically to have an arm for uh, laser wake field acceleration to enable a um, multi-GV electron beam, which can then collide with the petawatt laser. And so, uh, just as the uh, electric fields being boosted um, when interacting with very energetic particles, uh, the intensity of the laser is also boosted, in fact, by the, the square of the, the energy of the particles. Um, and so for GV particles, a petawatt laser uh, looks like a zettawatt laser, which is uh, 10 to the 21 watts, uh, uh, an eye-wateringly large number, um, to those particles. So uh, uh, that's the motivation for the name. And, the, and the, um, the physics, one of the physics goals is, is uh, the first step in um, what's hopefully a succession of facilities that will eventually get to the point of producing a macroscopic amount of electron positron, uh, so antimatter plasma, uh, a large blob of it uh, from uh, next to vacuum. Um, so we have to start with a seed particle, but um, uh, we can, from a tiny seed, we can grow a large plasma. Um, with Zeus, um, uh, at this stage with the parameters, the prediction is we should be able to um, get a multiplication of, of six of our start particles. So if we start with a, a hundred picocoulombs of, um, of uh, electrons accelerated by Wakefield acceleration, we can convert them to uh, more than half a nanocoulomb of positrons, which will also be compressed into a a femtosecond beam. So that's a, a potentially very interesting um, platform. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much. So just to summarize uh, what I've told you about, so uh, ultra-fast lasers are an uh, incredibly um, useful tool and are used throughout physics. You'll have seen, if you look at other Saturday morning physics talks, that lots of talks talk about um, ultra-fast uh, lasers and applications. Um, in this case, I'm talking about the specific application of uh, incredibly high power ones, uh, which have uh, the, some of the strongest fields there are, uh, which can be used to, to miniaturize particle accelerators. So it's already demonstrated um, uh, effective miniaturization um, of uh, electron accelerators um, and uh, X-ray sources. Uh, we can use them to study the physics of the strongest electromagnetic fields in the, in the universe. And uh, we are constructing a new international user facility um, at the University of Michigan called uh, Zeus, which should be here in the next few years. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Professor Thomas, for that splendid presentation and uh, also for the great physics demonstrations that you showed. I want to do a quick shout out <clears throat> to uh, Monica Wood, uh, the uh, manager of our demonstration lab for uh, and, and her staff as well for putting uh, those demonstrations together and they do this uh, for uh, for our physics department uh, uh, lectures also. So thank you for that, Monica. You saw Monica during during the lecture, uh, helping with the demonstrations. <clears throat> so we have several interesting questions from uh, the audience. Uh, I encourage you to send more um, to the uh, physics at umich.edu. Uh, um, email address. So let me encourage you to, to do that. Um, so Alec, um, let's uh, start with a question that 
kind of bears on on something really interesting that uh, the University of Michigan was responsible for. Uh, as you gathered from uh, Alex talk, uh, the U of M has been a leader in uh, optical physics over many years and uh, has uh, a leadership role in developing uh, the frontiers of uh, high field laser physics. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that was really interesting uh, from the audience was whether lights from lasers can have a harmonic content similar to uh, to the harmonics that uh, are very uh, common in, in sound waves. So could you address that, please, Alec? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, oh, I'm getting a bit of a funny echo. Um, which is a little strange. It makes me sound like a demon from the night. Um, Yes. Okay. I think. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thank you, Roy. And I'd also like to extend my thanks to uh, to Monica and her team for the for the demos. That was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so yes, the, the question is: Does laser light have harmonic overtones? And the the, the simple answer is is yes. Um, and indeed, um, uh, this is uh, one of the ways that um, we we create our short pulses. Uh, as as Roy alluded to. Um, Creation of the second harmonic um, of light uh, was a development that was that was uh, came in uh, the University of Michigan in the 1960s. Uh, Peter Franken, um, and and actually on on that I would uh, draw people's attention to Herb Winfield's um, Saturday morning physics talk, which was uh, last year and um, uh, is is still available. I, I will take a tangent from that and say that. Um, uh, there are mechanisms that uh, uh, generate uh, 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 high harmonics, uh, harmonic overtones of the fundamental um, frequency um, of a laser in high in, in high intensity physics as well. So when you get to um, very high intensities, the electron motion um, in a laser field becomes very anharmonic. Um, uh, and because uh, when when electrons oscillate, they radiate. Uh, um, if uh, there are higher higher order harmonics to their motion, then that is reflected in the in the light that's that's created. So there's several examples of this. The, the most simple example is if you if you just have Thomson scattering. So if you have uh, uh, electrons oscillating in a laser field, um, they will radiate light at the um, same frequency as the laser field until the laser free field gets so intense that um, they start becoming relativistic. So they have a, a relativistic mass. Then uh, they're, because um, their velocity can never go higher than the speed of light, if they're accelerated very, very rapidly, they sort of come up to the speed of light and then sort of stay there and then drop down to minus the speed of light. And so their motion becomes almost like a square wave. So if uh, since the question is talking about harmonic overtones with sort of analogies to sound waves, then um, if, if you if you know what a, a square wave looks like in sound, you, you end up with the same sort of thing uh, in terms of the electron motion. And so those harmonics are reflected in um, the light that's emitted. Another interesting example of this is if uh, light reflects off a mirror, um, then uh, the, the the light will just reflect off at the same frequency as it came on. There is an interesting thought experiment, which I think is due to Einstein, which is where if you have a mirror that's moving at close to the speed of light, the light uh, that's reflected will be um, uh, Doppler upshifted. So uh, it's just like the Doppler effect when you hear the siren of a, the, the 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 sound of a, a police car as it goes past, so that it's it's higher as it comes towards you and then lower as it goes away from you because the sound waves get uh, compressed. Well, the same thing happens um, with with lights reflecting from a relativistic mirror. Now, with high intensity lasers, we 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 can 
get this interesting effect where the light is so intense that it pushes on the surface of the mirror a substantial amount so that the mirror starts oscillating. And then when the light reflects off it, it's Doppler shifted, but it's Doppler shifted by um, this modulation from the mirror uh, moving. So between no Doppler shift and then a large Doppler shift. And so then you get, again, a very complex harmonic structure. So the, the, that's a rather expanded answer to the question. Uh, there's there's uh, lots of examples of this. So yes, indeed, you, you can have, you can create uh, harmonic overtones and uh, from light and, and uh, when in fact those harmonic uh, overtones are uh, locked in phase, so in other words, so arranged so that the peaks all line up at a single point, that's where we can generate intense bursts of, of light. Um, you're, you're muted, Rod, by the way. <laughs> Just, uh, so thanks, Alec, uh, for going over that history uh, with, uh, with sound waves. Uh, a related question, how does the light stretcher work? And uh, can it make uh, frequencies traveling at different distances to delay the arriving time of one pulse relative to another? And I think this question is related to uh, to the chirp process. So maybe you could say a, a few more words about how the chirp uh, is, uh, how the dispersion of light is, is involved in that. Absolutely. So, um, uh, so, so when you when you have a a, a very short pulse of light, it has to contain lots of different colors in it. This is sort of one misnomer that sometimes in um, textbooks is that one property of laser light is that it is monochromatic, in other words, just a single color, which is is not accurate. Um, a light can be, uh, a laser light can be a superposition of lots, uh, a, um, a mixture of lots and lots of colors. And indeed, you have to have lots and lots of colors uh, to create a, um, a short pulse. This is actually somewhat analogous to um, uh, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. Um, uh, but uh, so you need a certain range of colors to construct a pulse that's very, very short. And in the video, I, I tried to show how we need to add colors up uh, so that their peaks and troughs cancel in, in such a way to make a short pulse. That said, now, if you've got a short pulse, you have all these colors, um, you have all this color content, but it's all locked together in phase to make this short pulse. What you can do is um, chirp the pulse, that means stretch, stretch it out um, uh, using um, either prisms or gratings. So what prisms or gratings do is separate colors so that they travel at different angles. And I don't know if I, I oh, I can share screen here. I don't know if I, so I hadn't actually prepared for this, but maybe I should bring up the the diagram again. Um, so it's going to take me a second to find the presentation. Um, Well, okay, I'm, uh, I think it's, oh, no, there it is, okay. Okay, if I, if I can share screen. Uh, okay. Um, okay. There are there are security issues with um, sharing uh, through the macOS, which means I'd have to quit and restart. So, okay, I got. But um, uh, so 
you 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 can refer back to the to the lecture or, or there's plenty of pictures of this. So when you when you have a grating, if you send a beam of light into a, a grating or a prism, it splits all the the colors so that they travel uh, at different uh, angles. Um, if you then uh, put in a, a second grating, then then all those colors will um, uh, uh, the the angles will all be brought together again in a collimated um, beam. Um, and then if you use a four uh, grating arrangement, you can basically um, uh, bring the colors back together again into the original beam, only because they're all traveling at different angles, the, the different uh, color components have had a, a different path. So the blue colors have traveled a longer path than the red colors, which means that the, they uh, they are full behind with respect to the, the red colors, and that stretches it out in time. That's essentially what's um, what's happening. Uh, yeah, I, so it's, um, so uh, uh, essentially a similar arrangement to that, but with um, an additional optic um, is the difference between a stretcher and a and a and a compressor. Um, so so hopefully that sort of answers the question. Um, You're, you're muted again, Rick. Yeah, thanks, Alec. Uh, related question, uh, does an individual photon travel in a straight line, you know, as, as we were taught in elementary school, uh, or does it follow uh, a, a different trajectory uh, during the process of uh, amplification? Um, and I think uh, maybe the question is related to electron trajectories in a plasma. <laughs> rather than... um, so that, that that question, does an individual photon travel in a straight line or does it follow the curves of uh, sine waves, um, is actually a, a very deep and complicated question. And um, uh, this actually gets to the ph philosophy of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so what I will say is that if you want to calculate um, uh, what a uh, how a photon interacts, you just uh, calculate it using wave equations describing its wave propagation, um, and that works. But if you detect a photon, then it is uh, a single blip. Like a like a like an uh, like a, a single particle that's travelled in a straight line. Um, uh, this is something that's known as the measurement problem and has uh, plagued uh, philosophy uh, of science for 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 a while. Um, the so uh, um, so the the answer so there's there's not a a, a good answer I can. I can give to that. Uh, what I can say is it certainly um, obeys the wave equations, so the, the curves of sine waves, so uh, um, the diffractive nature of, of waves as they, they propagate out um, for all calculations until the point when the photon is either absorbed or um, emitted, um, uh, at which case it becomes uh, particle-like. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, this, this is this is a, a very good question, but I don't have um, a straightforward answer to that. Sorry, Roy, you're you're muted again. So yeah, that is, is a really deep question. Here's here's another uh, question that uh, it came from. Uh, the audience, which is really interesting. What are the uh, experimental dangers of working with uh, the cascading amplification process? Uh, uh, the, the rest of this question is to do with some other questions to do with blowing things up, if you're not careful. Um, and uh, it brings, uh, the question goes on, it brings to mind nuclear bombs, but uh, not sure if that's a good analogy. <laughs> I'm not sure either. 
So um, the the question is very good, but uh, the but uh, no one needs to worry. Um, the the reason is that so actually yes the so in terms of this exponentiation um, and this rapid exponentiation that 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 definitely has some analogies to how a um, a uh, a bomb would go off or or other cascading processes. There's lots of examples of this in nature. The the reason why we don't need to worry is because um, the uh, the way any of these cascades work is that uh, they're drawing energy ultimately from from the from the laser field. So uh, um, at best, the most laser energy that uh, sorry the most energy that you can develop in the cascade is the amount of laser energy in the laser and uh, in early experiments so the experiments we talk about with zeus we will be limited by uh, uh an even uh lower uh, uh limit than that in that it will be limited by the particle beam energy rather than the laser field energy um at, uh, in a future facility it may be possible to um uh efficiently uh, convert the laser energy but um you're always limited to that that amount of energy. So, the most uh, powerful, uh, in, in in terms of the, the the most energy in a short pulse there is on uh, Earth at the minute, uh, that would be the um, the National Ignition Facility, uh, which is a, a facility for doing laser fusion research in um, in Livermore. Uh, so that is a, a megajoule. Uh, laser system. Uh, it's it's also not a ultra short pulse, so it couldn't do any of the physics I'm talking about here. But uh, the most, you know, in the most wildly optimistic scenario at the moment, uh, you could convert uh, a megajoule of energy, uh, which is which is a, a minuscule fraction of what you might get in a. In it. So this is not going to be a. Uh, 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 something that anyone needs to worry about in terms of its destructive power. And um, there is a, an, a related question, uh, which is to do with uh, basic theoretical processes and limits to the amount of power that uh, that a laser pulse can uh, deliver. This, this and is that is not really related to the materials, but to some basic physics like breakdown of the vacuum, for example. Yeah, this is this is a this is a, a, a great question. So, um, uh, so so is there a limit to how much power we can um, have in a laser pulse, not sending it through the the materials, but sending it through the vacuum itself? Um, and uh, yes, there will be. So so first of all, there is a um, there is a discussion if there is even a limit to. Um, the electric field strength before we talk about power the, the the field strength in a laser that you could get so there is this uh swing us out a limit um at which if you have a field of that strength um and there are some technical um uh issues with the, the configuration of the field but essentially uh um at that limit you start producing um prolific amounts of electrons and positrons from the vacuum, which will draw energy from the light and also create material which interacts with the, the light. So uh, you might think that you, you can't get very far beyond that, um, that limit. That limit in electric field strength is um, uh, six orders, so a million times in, in terms of power, uh, compared to where we are today so um, that's that's one possible limit but that's that's uh, that's assuming that we're focusing tightly um, if we don't have the laser focused tightly so we have a collimated beam is there a power limit there well there so there are some theoretical calculations that say well if you have uh, you can polarize the vacuum so the vacuum so these electron positron pairs in the vacuum can uh, can uh, uh, polarized, so they act like a, um, a medium um, and have a refractive index associated with them. So uh, if you have uh, a, a beam of light traveling through the vacuum, um, you can get an effect where the 
uh, refractive index changes uh, as you go from the center of the beam outwards uh, in such a way that it will cause uh, self-focusing of the beam. Um, now where that, so, so if you have a beam of a certain power above a certain power threshold, it will, it'll always be enough to overcome diffraction and the beam will collapse down until it focuses to the point where uh, you, you reach this um, breakdown limit. Um, so yes, there, uh, there is a theoretical limit to the amount of power you could have in a, a laser beam. Um, it is, uh, beyond our imagination in terms of what we could create at the moment, but uh, there's cert certainly that. So so the, these sort of very, very high field strengths, that's the interesting thing, that the vacuum, I mean, the breakdown of the, va the vacuum is a sort of e extreme example of this, but we should also see um, <clears throat> nonlinear optics and uh, 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 associated with the vacuum. So the vacuum itself starts behaving like a, a medium. Um, and this is a whole other uh, branch of uh, investigation. Yeah, it's uh, uh, related to uh, to another question, and that is uh, to do with um, uh, is there a, a potential to use this process to generate thrust uh, without feed mass for you know the conventional feed mass for rocket propulsion uh, uh, in space. That is that is a good question. I mean, certainly it's not something that I think anyone would want to um, uh, explore too rigorously at the moment. And the reasons are just technological limitations. So uh, the lasers we have at the minute um, are very low efficiency, very, very low efficiency. So as in you need a, um, they, they do not create uh, the laser lights uh, with anything better than maybe 10 to the minus for, uh, uh, 0 0.0001 efficiency or something. Um, but let's say that technological um, limit could be overcome um, and you could get these high power lasers um, with, with high efficiency. Um, it's a good question. So you, you are essentially converting, um, uh, you're, you're using, you're, you're uh, converting the, the momentum of the laser itself, so the, the laser photons carry some momentum into uh, particles. Um, so uh, there's nothing, there's no energy conservation uh, tricks here. I mean, essentially whatever you have in terms of momentum just from the laser, you convert to particles. Um, whether that gives you an improvement in thrust, I, I suspect. Um, I suspect not. Um, I'd, I'd have to think about that a bit more. It's it's an interesting idea, um, but uh, I, I, you, you don't get any sort of bootstrapping effect. You, you, the momentum you have that you can transfer uh, is just the momentum you start with in in the laser pulse itself. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't think this mechanism itself can can give you any any boost, but I I could be missing something there. Well, we're uh, coming up on on the R uh, on the magic R. Uh, we have a number of other questions which uh, we didn't really get to, but I'm sure that uh, Professor Thomas uh, will be happy to to uh, send an email. Um, giving a little bit more detail on, on those few questions that we didn't get to. And um, I want to conclude uh, uh, some, with some thanks uh, to our communications manager, Carol Raybuck, for her very able overall organization of uh, the Saturday morning physics uh, this, this semester. This was our very first uh, attempt at a virtual uh, Saturday morning physics series of presentations. And um, I also want to thank my co-host, Tim Chapp, and uh, Carl Cole, who's our uh, video production manager from the Michigan Media Organization. So thank you all. Uh, we do hope to be back um 
in the winter of 2021. Things are still a little bit unclear. Uh, we do continue, we'll be virtual like this semester. And um, it will be uh, announced as, as we go. So please watch this space. Uh, I wanna thank you all for your continuing interest in uh, Saturday morning physics at Michigan. And uh, please have a safe and enjoyable holiday season. And we hope to get together in the new year. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this semester's uh, presentations. And thanks again for your uh, support of Saturday morning physics.